Yes. Uh, you all know I'm a chaplain, so I always do all these presentations with opening with prayer, if I may. <clears throat> Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable unto you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. My, <clears throat> as I was headed out the door this morning, I was uh, gouging my wife a little bit. <laughs> How come you're not going to be here with me? And uh, <laughs> it's, I feel like Peyton Manning. This is the box. <laughs> so she had, I said, you know, I was up at 3.30, of course, getting ready for this. So I said, are you not getting up to go and join me? And a big hand came out from underneath the sheet, picture of a cat. And we got three cats at home, so we're fond of cats, as, as my good friends from where I live, Bill Zesser and Bob Snow, know. But the, I, I was caught by the <clears throat> inscription underneath the cat. It reads, it's only possible to live happily ever after on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's only possible to give a decent presentation if you can say some important things, hopefully some important things to you, because I lived them. Uh, I want you to think about Ringling Brothers Barn and ba Bailey Circus, like three rings, one ring, two ring, three ring, and I'll be in each of the three rings, and I may jump back and forth. And of course, I'm speaking with a metaphor here. The first ring is what I call looking back what really did happen to me. Second ring is called looking at the moment. What does it all mean? And the third ring is <laughs> where do I go from here? Okay? Backwards, right now, later on. So I come with <laughs> uh, uh, a word that I finally was able to hear. Just came back from my cardiologist three days ago. Two years ago, I had one blocked artery from Agent Orange, uh, and he gave me the rotor rooter treatment. He didn't stent me, but he he did his thing, and that worked good for a while. But it's back, so I have a angiogram scheduled a couple of weeks, and I. I went with my wife to his office recently, and I said, Doc, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 is uh, no trouble, 10 is I'm in the grave. Where am I? He says, right now you are a 7. But unless you change your diet and lose weight, you will soon be 10. I said, well, uh, what is about that message do you wish me to understand? And my wife says, see? I've been telling you that for years. And I've got the Bill Clinton disease. You know, too many McDonald's for too long. And there's an old Eastern Kentucky saying, too long stupid, maybe too late smart. So I, I took it to heart, you know. I don't want to die. I want to live however long the good Lord uh, allows. But in order to do that, i got to do my bit. i got to do my part. So... Enough said about that. Now, each of you has an outline of my active service. It's printed there. You can refer to it, read it again. But what I want to do is give you uh, what I call my hallmark moments of my Air Force chaplaincy, three years. I was in the chaplaincy from 67 to 70 with the last of that time being in Vietnam. Where I was in Vietnam, just as you look at the map, um, was a near a place called Quinon, Q-U-I-N-H-O-N, and it's right in here. Uh, you can, well I can't, my eyes just don't see it much anymore, but it's in the southeastern part of the 
South Vietnam, and it was right 18 miles. Thank you. It was 18 miles from the air base at Phuket, which was here. 18 miles to this uh, city, and it, and right north of that was the leprosarium where I worked, uh, housing the orphans. And I did something with them every Friday. And right near also Phuket, another 30 miles up the coast was a leprosarium, a colony of lepers of 5,000 families. And every, every Friday, I would load a two and a half ton truck of supplies that we begged, borrowed, or stole. And three chaplains would drive it up to the leprosarium. We did that. That was the ministry off base, if you will. Now, highlights, hallmarks. June 1st, 1969 was my first day in country, and it was a mo mo momentous day for me. <laughs> After that giant plane ride of 28 hours from McCord Air Force Base in Washington, two hops over to Cameron Bay, and then from there by Goonie Bird to uh, Phuket, I fell out of that plane, <laughs> exhausted along with everybody else. They escorted us to the, the showers where we could clean up and where we had uh, our first uh, Army, uh, excuse me, Air Force clothes. Keep going. And, and basically, uh, the clothes fit me then, they don't now. What I wear now is what fits me now. <laughs> is that okay? You all have to work this. I can. All right. What I want to do is get uh, to June 1st. And on June 1st, uh, approximately 7 o'clock at night, I was all soaked up, hair, shower, feeling better, when all of a sudden, a strange guy I never had met before tackled me, wrestled me to the ground in the showers, and he whispered in my ears, I'm not queer, I'm trying to save your life. What do you mean? He said, just listen, just listen, which I did. I heard the first, the, to my ears, noise of a 122 millimeter rocket coming in from the VC. It hit right in front of the showers, and around the showers were concrete walls. And it sprayed the metal all over Hell's Half Acre. I was still on the ground, not knowing what was going on. So the guy said, listen, remember that. And if you hear it again, get down. Okay, that was the first hallmark moment. Second one occurred, same day, same night actually. About an hour later, cleaned up, rinsed off in my uniform, headed out to the MP posts. Um, I had a driver, a chaplain specialist. He was driving, I was in the right seat. When 30 minutes out onto the path, our Jeep ran over an IUD. Blew my butt right into the air and him. I landed in a rock pile and was unconscious for three days. Couldn't hear a squat. After hospitalization, drugs, therapy, and finally getting my grounding back. <laughs> Base chaplain says, who was a colonel? He says, welcome to Vietnam. I said, yeah. So I went back to my business. You know, I was there to do a job. By golly, I was going to do it. <laughs> uh, flip to the other hallmark moment. I'll do those briefly and then get into other stuff. Um, December 24th, 1969. We were in this two and a half ton truck on the way to the leprosarium, taking a load of uh, groceries up to the top. Now in this leprosarium at the very top of the hill, 
were, as I said, these 5,000 lepers. And the place was, was staffed by French Carmelite nuns. And they took care of the folks. They knew when they came to the leprosarium that they would uh, contract the disease. Because le leprosy is always contagious. Always. And is endemic to a west, a wet, moist, tropical climate. So Vietnam is a perfect petri dish, if you will, for contracting the disease. And so nothing stopped these nuns. They went there. They served. And then they died. While the chaplains and I were unloading the truck, they'd always entertain us, have a, a wonderful five or six course dinner, gourmet dinner, and the wine people, uh, the Rothschilds, have you heard of the Rothschild wine? I mean, it's the Rolls Royce of wine. Uh, currently, a bottle of good red wine is, oh, at least $1,000. But back then, I was there in 69, so since the Rothschilds was, were supplying the money to operate the leprosarium, they would also supply the nuns with all the wine they wanted. And they, they m were very <laughs> liberal with their generosity. So three chaplains, one was a Baptist who became a Methodist. <laughs> he, wasn't a, he began as a teetotaler and then he uh, made, made his transition. So we'd have this big lunch got, I wouldn't say knee, knee walking, but we had to ask where the beach was. <laughs> and we went out there and slept it off and lay in that sand, had our feet dangling in the water, while all the time F4s were flying over doing their deal. Napalm, sounds of uh, guns going off. And that was the setting that induced in all of us the very beginning of post-traumatic stress disorder. We all got it. I don't know anyone who's ever been in combat. I don't know anyone who has ever served in a, in a war zone, in the killing fields, who doesn't come back from, with, with, without PTSD. When I moved to uh, Colorado three years ago, I checked in with a VA, saw their psychiatrist, she says, yeah, just like your wife says, you're just nuts. <laughs> and with good reason. You know, I still had dreams. I had to take sleeping medications. Thank God we've got drugs. Because in terms of my recovering from heart disease, I have got to get sleep. And without drugs, I wouldn't get what I need. So I'm very thankful. All right, May 1st, 1970 was the third snapshot. This is of the orphanage in Quinion, the, uh, the, the orphanage of the war uh, babies, uh, ages from 3 to 15 maybe. Once a week, we would always load these children up into a vehicle, drive to the place where they could... Uh, and we'll look at that here in a minute, where they could uh, bathe in the ocean. And it was so good for us because we missed our families, we missed our kids, we missed our wives. But being around those, those uh, orphans who had no mother or father, some of whom had missing limbs, I would just scoop these little guys up and gals, hold them near and dear. They couldn't understand my speech, nor me, their Vietnamese but they could understand my hugs and they were able to receive from us and we were able to receive from them and I'm really really thankful for those memories the fourth and last uh, hallmark moment actually is a uh, series of 12 events where as an Air Force chaplain. I was stationed on this base, and those of you who have been to Phuket knows it was the top Air Force base in Vietnam. It had revetments for 96 F-4s, 
It had uh, two Olympic-sized swimming pools, one golf course. Now, this was a place for in-country R&R, and that's where a lot of people from around that area came. And I was privileged to be there. I called it Disneyland East. <laughs> Tom, you know what I was meaning. You guys who were in the trenches all the time. and Well, my world was different, but we all could have been uh, eliminated just in a heartbeat. So the Army chaplains would, would always get overrun out in the killing fields, always. There were four or five different uh, um, areas where the VC and the Army, they engaged in uh, Herculean warfare. I mean, noisy. And after every uh, event, <clears throat> The army chaplains would go in and tend to the three categories, dead, dying, and wounded. And sometimes they just couldn't handle the, the bodies, literally. So I got to know one of the army chaplains. He said, would you be willing to come and help us out from time to time? I said, any time. So once I got known that I was willing to jump in that helicopter, I got picked up 12 times during my year there. And I would stay with the dead, died, and wounded until I had to leave. My grandfather gave me two 44 caliber magnums, and I was a crack shot. And before I went to Nam, you know, chaplains are not supposed to be armed, but every chaplain I knew was. <laughs> uh, one said to me, he said, if you want to go back home, start packing. We didn't need concealed carry permits back then, for God's sakes. <laughs> Insane. Uh, so on several situations, I did have to shoot my way to get back home. I did see people dying, but they were shooting at me. And I wanted to come back to my wife and three kids. And I said, dear Lord, forgive me. Bam, 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 and I'd do it. Not a, my friend Al, who's a full colonel, Tom Courant, one of your past speakers, will meet Al. He's a full colonel, head of an artillery battalion of 175 millimeter howitzers. I said, you know, the reason we don't win these wars is because we don't follow what the wars are to do. I said, well, Al, what is it? He said three things, maim, kill, and destroy. And he says, it's simple. We could have ended Vietnam War had Johnson and McNamara allowed our pilots, our B-52 guys, to bomb north of Hanoi and take out the dam. It would have flooded the whole thing out. We'd have been home, and 58,000 people would not have lost their lives, many, many less. And in Robert McNamara, in his book, uh, called Hope, said, I was wrong. Okay. I don't expect somebody to be perfect all the time. But for a year, two years, however long that knucklehead, he and Johnson were in power, you can't micromanage a war from Washington, and that's what they're doing, and that's what they're still doing now. So that's, in essence, because I want to leave plenty of time for any questions, how did I, I was the youngest chaplain ever to be admitted into the Air Force. I was 25 at the time. And uh, why did I go? Well, I just wanted to. Seemed like the thing to do. I have five generations, or yeah, five generations of people who served. A great, great, great grandfather in the Civil War for the North, a great-great-grandfather in the Spanish-American, a great-grandfather uh, in World War I. He was a tr trench officer in France, or Germany, or both. I don't remember now. And my dad was an Air Force, at that time, Army Air Corps. Flew B-17s, and he 
flew 65 combat missions over Germany. And he was on D-Day. He flew over D-Day on June 24. So it was my turn in the barrel. Glad, glad to have served. I never even thought different. But who, how did I get there? That's what I want you to, to hear. And I'm hoping that whatever I have said may elicit, touch, elicit questions, touch you where you live, and I'll be glad to respond in the best way I can. I picked three people who most influenced me. Mike, you haven't heard this. One was my grandfather, M.K. At 17, I was attending the University of Louisville, and I didn't have anything to do in the summer, and I needed some money. You know, girls won't go out with broke boys. <laughs> so he says, why don't you drive me around? Now, Granddad had enough money to do what he wanted. He had a, I remember now, a gold Cadillac convertible. And I said, all right. <laughs> and so I got behind the wheel, and he was riding. His wife had died of throat cancer, and he was footloose and fancy free. And I was 17 and just in love with my grandfather. Loved him. Why? Because he took time with me. He was interested with me. He always kept track of me. And he would give me the benefit of his wisdom. So, he says, Bob, I need a chauffeur. Jump in. It's like driving Miss Daisy while I'm driving the grandfather. So, we go all over the country. We're like highway department workers, no disrespect. Nowhere to go and all day to do it in. <laughs> so, um, I underline the word, no disrespect. So, we jump in the car and for three months we went all over the country put 28,000 miles on that car. And those nights with grandfather, <laughs> one, one example, you will know by now that uh, I'm not your typical minister. Um, at times I can be coarse. My wife would say at times I could even be crude. It's not something I like about me, but that's just who I am. Um, enough said. So I was in with my granddad, having the time of my life. My heart was open. It was an adventure. And so wherever we stopped, I remember one time in Cove Lake, Tennessee, at a Holiday Inn there. Granddad was was in one room and I was in the other one. And I could hear him. And you know what's coming next. Gold Cadillac. He attracted women like a magnet. I said, Granddad, when are you going to start interviewing? But one night, he got all lubricated with whatever he was on. And he and his lady friend were making a lot of racket. And I had the glass up to the thing <laughs> vicariously. <laughs> so here's the thing. You know, my granddad just loved him because he went out of the, he said, you hold that position. So I said, what? God, what's he mean? His door opens up. He storms out, goes to his car, and he's wearing nothing but cowboy boots. <laughs> he pops the trunk, gets in there, gets his prophylactics, back in, shuts the door, back in bed, and the show continued. How old were you then? Seventeen. <laughs> my, my wife, Mike, is, she said, that's made an indelible impression on you for the rest of our marriage. <laughs> I don't wear cowboy boots every night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay, so my granddad taught me a lot of things. Our family, he started our coal company in 1908. Dad took it over in 45 after he got back from the war. I took it over in 1970. 
when I got back from Nam. Dad says, I want you to run the business. I said, well, I don't know anything about coal mining. He says, but I'll teach you. And he did. He did. He taught me how to be underground, run machinery, do everything I asked my employees to do. I learned it all. From the drift mouth of the opening of the, into the mountain to the working face was five miles. So you're underground. Didn't bother me. I knew the mountain was safe, or at least I thought so. We took no shortcuts, because when the boss is in there, you better jolly well have everything right. All right, granddad, my father, he loved me in his own way. He trusted me. We had 800 employees, okay, and I was in charge of all of them. So dad had one rule after he taught me the business. Son, if it costs 50000 or more, talk to me. If it's under fifty, leave me alone. Now, he trusted me. And I never betrayed that trust. I learned how to love your father as a very young child. He did not believe in spare the rod and spoil the child. He didn't spare it. <laughs> uh, I said, Dad, you know, after I got out of seminary, he, uh, uh, that's not the right translation of that verse in Proverbs 13, 24, which reads, and you can see Dad's eyes glaze over, <laughs> whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Dad was careful. When I was going, loading onto the, plane in uh, Louisville's uh, Standard for Field to go to Vietnam. He and mother were there. And mother cried. Dad did too. And so did I. And he said, come back alive. He says, there's more to life and I want you to have it. Lastly, the third influence beside my grandfather, my dad, was my mom. My mom was the Sunday school teacher in our church. She taught Bible stories. I learned all the parables of Jesus at her knees. You know those maps where you have uh, stick figures and flannels, put flannel. That's what she used. I still remember her movements. That's where I learned how to love Jesus. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer or respond to any questions you might have. Do you have any uh, Westmoreland? We were talking about uh, McNamara and Johnson. Did you talk to uh, Westmoreland while you were over there? I'm glad you asked that question. I did talk to a four-star general who flew into Phuket from Hickam Air Force Base, and we were all lined up in the flight line. And uh, this general, I don't recall his name, came up to me, turned toward me, and says, Chaplain? Yes, sir. I want you to do something for me right now. I said, sir, okay, what? He pointed to the stack of 500-pound bombs. He said, I want you to go over there, put your hands on those bombs, and bless them. And even I knew this, this was a turning point. <laughs> he says, I said, sir, I can't do it. Why not? I said, well, my boss won't let me. He says, I don't know your boss, and don't give a damn. He says, I've given you a direct order. I said, I still can't do it. He says, well, I'll write you up an officer effectiveness report that you'll have to crawl under a wire in order to stand up. So I, I held fast, you know, the, I let her rip. You know, I didn't sign up to betray Jesus Christ, no matter if it's four stars or not. And he did. He wrote that, that report that ended my Air Force career. But, you know, there's a, the scripture that says, God works together for good in all things who are in, for everyone who is called according to his purposes, not the generals. I remember my biblical ancestors, Job, 
all these other guys, had, they had tough times. Their life was destroyed. My life changed. I got back home, found out that my wife at the time was uh, cheating on me. In fact, she cheated on me to get me to go to Vietnam. You all know that story about David and Uriah? I was Uriah. David had a sleeping deal with Bathsheba, sent Uriah out to the front lines to be killed. He wasn't killed, but David had him killed. So my boss sent me to Vietnam so he could uh, get with my wife. But even then, that was good news for me, ultimately. At the time, it seemed like a bomb went off in my life. <laughs> went through divorce. I had three kids. I lost the children. Don't know where they are to this day. All of them. Gone. Even though I've paid tons of money to try to find them. I was so insane about this that here I was in the coal business that I hired a hitman, paid him half of 25000 to find her and eliminate her. That's insane. I'm really glad he didn't find her. I wouldn't be here. But God uses these situations because at that moment, my life history changed. We divorced, and as I like to say, I traded up. <laughs> my current wife of 40 years, Judith, well, she's God's gift to me. Does that answer? Well, I can't, I don't know any guy in high rank who ultimately has, doesn't become a puppet. Because like Petraeus, when you go against the commander-in-chief, you're going to be emasculated. Other question? Yes. The story about the bomb. I love this story. It just did. Yeah. About the Yeah. Oh, I don't give it. I missed it. I'm sorry. Well, you can look at the tape. It's there. Yes. When you went to see the leopard, were you given any kind of preventive drug? No. Now, see, going to the leprosarium is just like going into the killing fields. They needed what I brought. I was willing to take the risks both times, continuously. And so did all the chaplains. Uh, I remember the last day at, at the lepers, leprosarium. One of the lepers who had no arm, no left arm and just a stub, he held his stub out to me to shake my hand. And when I pulled it back, I've still got part of his skin. But I loved him. And I, he loved me. He, he was very thankful. So, you know, these are, these are moments of history that not everyone has. But I was very blessed to have them. Another question? Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, first of all, you have to have a call from God to do this, be it minister or chaplain. Then you have to graduate from uh, not only university, but a three-year accredited seminary. I went to Louisville Presbyterian Seminary. Got my master's.